Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tony, and I am one of the teachers here at Straub Outdoors. I have uh, been a classroom teacher for like eight years now. So I've taught third grade and fourth grade, and I used to live in the Midwest. And now I live here in lovely Oregon, um, and I'm joined by my co-teacher today, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, everybody. My name is Zoe. I am an educator here at Straub Outdoors. I studied earth science in college. I also played college volleyball, which is pretty awesome. I just moved here about a year ago to teach outdoor school, and where I came from is Florida, and they actually don't have outdoor school in Florida, so... I'm really happy to be here and be able to teach you guys about my passion, which is nature. All right. So now you know us. I'm going to start our module for you today. And uh, Zoe, can you see the, uh, the slideshow okay? Is that showing up on your screen all right? Absolutely. I can see it good. Perfect. So as we said, uh, welcome. Uh, this is Straub Outdoor School, but this is um, a little bit of a module is what we'll use to describe it. Um, like we said, we are teachers at an organization called Straub Outdoors. Our organization uh, was named after a person, and that person's name was Bob Straub. He was the governor, and uh, he loved nature, and he worked really hard to protect it. At Straub Outdoors, we love to explore nature with students and learn all about science. And we share these learning ad adventures with students just like you at outdoor school um, all ac across the state of Oregon. And so um, today we have a fun science idea to share with you. Um, and we'll explore this idea by studying things in nature. Um, we're bringing outdoor school to you today with a lesson called We Eat Sunshine. Zoe, do you eat sunshine? Every day, and it's yummy. I do too, and it's delicious. It's made up of different parts, but uh, we both eat sunshine. And do you know what? You all eat sunshine too. Um, today in our module, we'll learn about how energy from our food was once energy from the sun. This includes food for some of the wildlife we may see outdoors um, where we live as well. Their food comes from energy from the sun too. And we're going to find out um, in just a minute. So before we jump into our module, we have a few expectations to share with you. So these are things that we um, want you to do at home or wherever you're completing this module. First up is please watch the whole video. So you can see the video camera next to number one. We wanna make sure that you are getting all the learning you possibly can at home. So make sure that you watch this video from the very beginning until the very end when we wave and when we say goodbye. So watch the whole video. And Zoe, would you like to tell the next expectation? Absolutely. So because this video is pre-recorded and you guys are kind of in the power seat, you may pause this video or rewind it whenever you need. A couple examples of when you might need to pause would be if you need to use the restroom or if we tell you to pause to think about an answer to a question or to maybe even jot down a couple of things for our activity that we're going to explain later. Um, an example of when you might need to rewind would be if we're talking a little bit too fast for you guys, or if your uh, family member, somebody in your house is calling your name and you need to go tend to them, uh, you may might miss something. Uh, feel free to pause or rewind any parts that you need clarification on or anything like that. Yeah, thank you, Zoe. Um, the rewind button um, is always there for you to use and the pa pause button as well. And you did tell a little bit about our next expectation. Um, this video is being pre-recorded. Um, Zoe and I uh, are recording this and it'll be used by students all over the state of Oregon. So um, knowing that, um, we'll... Um, We'll move into our fourth and final expectation there. It's my favorite one. All right. So the last one, y'all already got down pat, I'm sure, is to be creative and have fun. So some of the examples, I mean, 
I should say activities that we're doing today. Um, we're gonna use our um, creativity and also our science minds. We're gonna use both at the same time, which is pretty awesome. So just let your creative juices flow and have fun. That's right. And, you know, I think we can practice um, the pause expectation um, right now. So as I go to the uh, next picture here, um, think about what your favorite food is and pause the video. So now that you have your favorite food in your mind, um, Zoe and I are going to tell a little bit more about ourselves. We're going to share our favorite foods with you right now. Um, Zoe, what is your favorite food? So Tony, my all-time favorite food, well, I decide what my favorite food is by how often I eat this food. So for me, I would say my favorite food is cheese, but I don't eat it plain. So I'm going to give an, an example in a meal. So my favorite food, or I guess my favorite meal would be a chicken sandwich with a milkshake. <laughs> what what's your favorite food tony that's quite a, a good combination <laughs> of a favorite uh food there um my favorite food uh would have to be lasagna i love lasagna with some meat sauce um and maybe even some garlic bread to go with it since uh you had two parts of your favorite food i'll um share a second part of my favorite food too um wow we have pretty different favorite foods um, now I'm wondering, this is kind of silly a little bit, but gosh, what, what are our least favorite foods? What do we not like to eat? Um, God, I might need to, to think about this for a moment. Oh, you know, I one time uh, tried a food called falafel and I just didn't really like how it tastes. Um, and so that's my least favorite food. What about you, Zoe? So like you, um, I had to think about this for a while. Um, it was a lot easier for me to think of my favorite food than my least favorite. Um, I definitely grew out of my picky eating as I have uh, became an adult. Uh, but there's one thing that I've tried and I've tried it a couple times. And every time I just, I just don't like it. And I keep thinking that I will and I just haven't yet. Um, and that's olives. I wish I liked them, but I just don't. Yeah, that's okay. Um, you know, something I love is that there's such a variety in all the different foods that um, we can eat and that we can try. Um, you might really like some, and then you might not like others. Um, but food is really important for our lesson today. Um, we are going to be watching a video in just a few moments. Um, and this video is all about how the food that we eat like lasagna, like the chicken sandwich, um, comes from the sun's energy. Um, watch for the answer for this first question here. What is a consumer? So while you watch this video, please keep your eye out for um, the answer to that question. And um, Zoe, I think there's another question too that our friends at home should be watching for. Absolutely. So the second question we're going to ask you after watching this video is what are some of the animals that you saw watching this video so this video is actually really awesome we made this video at Straub Tony and I aren't in the video um but Straub made it and all of these animals are native to Oregon which is really awesome and native to Oregon means they have always been here they've been here for a really really long time like for generations and generations these animals have lived in Oregon which is awesome so I want to know at the end of this video, what are some of the animals that you saw, which are native to Oregon, which they all are. <laughs> all right. Um, and here we go for our video clip. Now, Zoe, can you just give me a thumbs up if you hear the audio? I don't hear it yet. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> let's, let's try again. How about, how about,
Behold the Pacific Sideband Snail. This species of snail is native to Oregon, which means they've lived here for a very long time. They like to hang out in cool forests, eating fungi and plants. And they're a tasty snack for shrews, mice, and raccoons. Snails are part of an amazing cycle of life in which one species, or kind of organism, provides energy, food, for another. But where does it all start? It starts with the sun. The sun is a big, superheated ball of gas that sends energy to the earth in the form of light. And this light is used by plants to produce food in the form of sugars to grow. That's why they're called producers. Most animals are called consumers because they consume or eat plants. Or they eat animals that eat plants. In fact, all of the food we eat can be traced back to the energy that comes from the sun. Pretty cool, right? Now, for a fun activity, you can create a poster that shows how the energy in food was once energy from the sun. Here's an example of a poster that shows how the sun provides energy for plants, which are eaten and provide energy to animals. Your poster may look different because it's your own creation, and that's a good thing. Continue watching this video to learn more fun facts about energy and the food you eat. Now, did you know that you can measure how much energy a food has? Energy is measured in calories. The more calories a food has, the more energy it contains. Let's take fast food. A cheeseburger has 375 calories. You could ride your bike for over an hour on the energy from that cheeseburger. But calories only measure how much energy a food has. They don't measure what kind of nutrients are in the food. Humans, like most animals, need a combination of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, as well as vitamins and minerals to grow and stay healthy. These are called nutrients. Fast food, like that cheeseburger, has many of these nutrients. But if you only ate cheeseburgers, you might not be getting all the nutrients you need. That's why it's important to eat different kinds of foods. So, energy from the sun is used by plants to make sugars, which they use as food to help them grow. Animals eat plants, or they eat animals that eat plants, and then use this energy to grow, move around, think, and do just about everything else. So, the next time you eat a cheeseburger or a salad, think about where its energy came from and all the things you can do with this energy. Oh, and be sure to look out for our friends, the snails. Wow, I don't know about you, Zoe, but I saw uh, lots of animals, and I saw um, maybe the answer to that first question uh, that I was asking us. Can you give me a thumbs up, Zoe, if you can see that video screen? Awesome. Um, yeah, so we both watched this video, and I'm going to ask you um, in a moment to pause, but I'll remind you of the questions. What is a consumer? And... What are some animals you saw in the video? Please write down or think of that. Pause the video now. Welcome back. Um, so Zoe, um, what is a consumer? Ooh, so my definition of a consumer after watching this video would be an animal that eats plants or that eats other animals that eat plants. So it's an animal that eats an animal or a plant. That's exactly right. Uh, well done. I can tell that you were watching the video carefully there. Um, and there was another question too, I think. Absolutely. So Tony, my question for you and all of you guys watching is, and a challenge for you, Tony, can you name at least five of the animals that you saw in the video, which are native to Oregon? Oh boy. 
Um, I'll start with the favorite one that I saw. I saw um, a cougar. It looked like the cougar was getting ready to pounce on another animal, um, may maybe like a deer that um, maybe was in the video. The cougar would eat that deer and get its energy there. The deer ate the grass and that got its energy from the sun. Okay, so I've said the deer, I've said the cougar. Um, oh, I remember seeing the, the beaver in the water. So okay. I got three animals so far. Um, I also saw a hawk um, fluttering yeah. off of a tree branch. I need one more. Oh, boy. Um, oh, the friend of Straub Outdoors. I saw um, the snail at the beginning and at the end. Yes, the Pacific sideband snail. Absolutely. And I've actually seen one of those in the wild before. Wow. I know yeah. I've um, seen, I think it's a banana slug. Um, and those are native to Oregon too. So like the snail, but not quite. Yeah, without a shell. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is a picture of some of the animals that uh, you saw in the video. Um, if there's others that you saw, you can write them down and pause. Welcome back. If you did pause and write down um, extra animals, um, we saw quite a few in that video. And so I think it's time for our next activity. Um, we talked all about these animals um, that are native to Oregon. And so now our activity that we're going to do next is called follow the food. Um, on your screen, you see a lovely burrito here. And that burrito has lots of different parts to it. Um, it's not just like the outside. If you look inside, you can see lots of ingredients. Can you see those ingredients okay, Zoe? Absolutely, it's making me a little hungry. Yeah, me, me too. Um, <laughs> and so I will start with the burrito here. The burrito is made, um, the outside at least, is made of a tortilla. And so there's a photo of a tortilla and so I'm going to trace um, the parts of the burrito back to the sun. Um, I'll do the example with the burrito, and then Zoe and I will share our favorite foods and how we can trace the energy back to the sun. So anyways, I said that um, the outside is the tortilla. And now tortilla, um, that is just grain um, and wheat that originally is a plant like this, and it is ground up and pressed really flat to get to a tortilla. And so this wheat plant is where the tortilla comes from. And the wheat grows um, healthy and strong because um, it takes in the energy from the sun and it makes the sugars that it needs to survive. Uh, plants can do that. That's a process called photosynthesis. And so plants um, take that energy from the sun and then that is how the tortilla is made. The next part of the burrito is the refried beans. Um, here's what they look like in my burrito. But I know beans, um, oh, beans are a plant. And so um, before they're mashed up and processed like this, they look like this as a plant. I, I wonder which part of the plant is the bean, Zoe? Do you think you can help me out? I think it's inside of that. It kind of looks like a green bean there, but I think the beans oh. that we use for refried beans are on the inside of that bean pod. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's right. It wouldn't be the leaf part, but it would be um, the inside of that bean pot. Okay, so that's where uh, the beans grow. And again, they are plants, so they're consume or they're um, producers, and they get their energy from our sun. Woohoo! I think I've got one more part of my burrito. It's the cheese, one of Zoe's very uh, favorite foods. And so cheese looks like this in my burrito. However, before then, it is a product of cows. So cows produce dairy and they um, that di those dairy products like milk and cheese are produced from healthy uh, cattle or cows. And so let me think, the cows will get, oh, oh, they'll get their energy by eating the grass. Like you see in the field here, different vegetation, um, they, eat all that up for energy so that they can um, walk around their pasture or where they might live. And the grass, oh, the grass gets its energy from the sun by using that photosynthesis process. And that is the burrito. So I'm gonna um, go back a few slides here. 
that's how I traced all the energy back to the sun for the burrito. Now, Zoe, would you like to trace uh, and follow the food for your favorite food? Absolutely. So if you guys don't remember, my favorite food is a chicken sandwich. And there's a lot of different things on my chicken sandwich that I like. So this might take a minute, but I'm going to go step by step. So imagine this is my chicken sandwich. I wish I had one to show you for reals. So here's my chicken sandwich. On the top and on the bottom, we have a bun, right? So the bun is going to be pretty similar to the tortilla. So the bun is going to be made from wheat or other grains. And these grains grow out in fields, sometimes on farms, sometimes naturally they just grow. And so those are plants, right? And we know that plants get their energy from the sun through a process of, called photosynthesis, right, Tony? Yes, that's right. <laughs> So there's my bun. Now I got the fillings inside my bun because I can't just eat a plain bun. So first things first, I have a lettuce. So lettuce is a plant, actually, if you guys didn't know. <laughs> lettuce is a plant <laughs> and it grows from the ground as well. And so the lettuce itself is going to get the energy from the sun, just like the other plants that do the same thing. All plants do photosynthesis, which is really awesome. So there's my lettuce. Next, I have the cheese, which we know cheese comes from cows uh, because they give us milk and cheese and ice cream and all the good dairy products that we most people love. Um, so from the cow comes the cheese. The cow is going to eat grass or other vegetation, which are plants. And those plants are gonna get their energy from the sun, boom. Next layer in my sandwich is the chicken. So chicken, they eat different types of things. Chickens usually are fed, uh, chicken feed would be considered like mostly corn, some other grains, which big shocker, we all know corn and other grains now are plants. So these plants that the chicken eats uh, get their energy from the sun. So technically the chicken is eating sun and I'm eating the chicken. So technically I'm eating the sun. Boom. And then the last thing on my sandwich is pickles. You got to have pickles. You got to have the pickles. So pickles are actually made from cucumbers, which a cucumber grows on a plant, which is really awesome. And that plant will get its energy from the sun to photosynthesize and grow that yummy zucchini that I will pickle with some vinegar and other spices to put on my sandwich. And I think that's all the ingredients. I think you got them. Would, would you like to tell about your milkshake? Oh yeah, a challenge. I'll do my milkshake. Yeah. So I like chocolate milkshakes, y'all. And so I got to do the chocolate and then I also got to do the ice cream part. So we know that cows give us ice cream. <laughs> Glorious. <laughs> um, and we know that cows eat grass and that grass gets its energy from the sun. So there's the ice cream part and then the chocolate part. So I don't know if you guys know this, but chocolate actually grows on a tree. Oh. And chocolate is made from a plant called cacao, which is really awesome. And so to make chocolate, you basically take the cacao plant and you mix it with some milk, which we know comes from cows. Um, and so I would, that plant would grow the cacao fruit by getting energy from the sun. Boom. Thanks, Zoe. That's um, awesome about the, the cacao plant. So that's where our yummy chocolate comes from after it um, gets processed from that plant. Uh, wonderful. Um, I'll share my favorite food. Um, so lasagna with a side of garlic bread. Um, now garlic um, is a plant and so then that just gets its energy right from the sun. The bread piece and the yummy noodles of my lasagna that are layered like this those are both grains. And so those grains grow in our earth uh, or maybe on um, a farm somewhere and they get uh, their energy from the sun. Now I'm moving to the inside of my lasagna. Um, there would be cheese in there and maybe some uh, meat and then even marinara sauce. 
So starting with the cheese, uh, that is a product from the cow. Similar to ice cream, um, cheese uh, is a dairy product produced by uh, cows. Cows get their energy by eating grass, and grass gets its energy from the sun. Um, moving right along to uh, the marinara sauce. So that red sauce is mostly a tomato base. There's other things included in that sauce, but tomatoes, um, those come from tomato plants. In fact, when I was your age in school, my family, we had a garden and we would grow our own tomatoes there and they get our, or they get their energy from the sun. And the final piece uh, is the meat in the meat sauce. And so um, cows uh, would be processed and um, their meat is uh, processed for us to eat. And it's a good source of protein and they uh, get their energy by eating grass and then grass from the sun. So you've gotten to hear three really super awesome examples today. Um, one from me, one from Zoe, and then the burrito on your screen. Um, you will get to try this out um, soon. So please um, listen to all the directions before we have you start on this activity. You'll make your own um, food energy poster. Now, um, this poster is going to include um, a lot of different things on it. And I, hmm, you know, before we even start this, Zoe, maybe we can have the students pause and think about how they can trace their favorite foods back to the sun. Absolutely. I think that's a great, a great idea. You guys could even share with somebody else um, in your class or maybe somebody else that's in your home or apartment uh, while you're there and, and talk to them, maybe teach them how to trace their food too. So you can pause now if you'd like to do that. Welcome back. Um, now we'll go ahead and start that activity. Um, and this is our food energy poster. Um, on the screen here, I um, may have Zoe talk a little bit about uh, this example poster. Um, she'll talk about this example and then I'll tell some directions. Then we've got two others to show you before you get to make your own. Absolutely. So this is an example. We have the scene or the landscape around us. We are obviously at a river somewhere in a forest. I'm guessing in Oregon. Mm -hmm. I would imagine. So <laughs> the energy is going to start with the sun, right? So the sun has all the good energies and this canvas plant um, along this river bank is going to absorb that energy and make sugars so that it can grow, which is really awesome. And so now that canvas plant has grown really big and tall thanks to the sun and photosynthesis. And now this ground squirrel is chilling on the river bank and it's getting a little hungry, just like me and maybe you guys after we talked about all of our food. <laughs> um <laughs> This ground squirrel is getting a little nibblish and it is going to eat from this camas plant. And so that squirrel is going to be our primary consumer. This primary consumer ate this camas plant, which is a producer, which is pretty awesome. And it's having a great time until this hawk comes by. It's also hungry. It was listening to us talk about food as well, and he needs to eat as well. So this hawk is going to come and he's going to swipe up our ground squirrel and he is going to get the nutrients from him. And that will be the end of this uh, transfer of energy all the way from the sun to the plant, to the squirrel, to the hawk. So technically, they're all eating the sun. That's right. And I can tell that this example has one producer, it has two consumers, and it has a landscape. So it has an environment on there. Um, remember, plants and trees use the sun's energy to make the sugars uh, that they use to grow, just like Zoe was telling. Um, when an animal, maybe like a beaver, eats a tree, it gets all the sugars that it needs, and it helps the beaver grow and stay healthy. When an animal, maybe like a robin, eats another animal, like a worm, um, the worm helps fuel the robin. The robin can build a nest, have a family, and uh, tweet and sing and do all the other robin stuff that it might do um, while it's living on our lovely planet. Um, 
This is another example of our poster, our food energy poster. Um, so let me um, tell a little bit more directions before um, Zoe talks about this one. Um, so in your uh, naturalist kit, you'll have a paper that says food energy across the top. That'll be what you'll use to draw, kind of like this example, your food energy uh, transfer. Um, printed at the top of the page, it says energy in our food comes from the sun. And so underneath that heading, you'll make your poster um, in your naturalist kit. You should have colored pencils and you'd have a pencil. Um, so those are some of the materials that you'll need to create your food energy poster. Um, be sure that you draw the landscape, just like Zoe and I have been saying. So you'll need to have the sun, um, plants and trees, um, and so at least one producer. It could be a plant, could be or a tree if you'd uh, wish. And you'll need to have two animals that might live there. A primary consumer, remember that's the one that eats plants, and a secondary consumer. So that would be something that maybe um, would eat the animal that ate a plant. I can think of maybe how like a wolf might hunt and eat a deer. And so a wolf would be a great example of a secondary consumer. Um, I'm going to let Zoe tell this example and watch how I draw my arrows because you'll need to draw arrows on yours. Absolutely. So as you guys can see, we're in a different part of Oregon now. We're not on the riverbank in a forest. We are on the coast. And we can tell this by the ocean in the background. We can tell this by the rocks and also the animals that we see in this picture. So just like the other example, I'm going to start with the sun. So the sun is up there at the top. Perfect. And we have actually quite a different amount of uh, producers. This person, the person that made this poster actually used to work for Straub and they did a really great job. Mm -hmm. Their drawing skills are a bit better than mine, or maybe a lot, <laughs> a lot of it better than mine. Um, so no pressure. Uh, this is just an example for you guys. Yours is going to look different than this. And it's supposed to look different. Everybody's is supposed to be different. So back to the thing. From the sun, we have different producers. We have some kelp there at the bottom. Got some seaweed and some other algae, which is really awesome. And we actually have phytoplankton. And phytoplankton, they get their energy from the sun as well. And it, they make their own food. So that's a different type of producer um, that you only really find out in the ocean. So they decided to add that, which is awesome. And there's a lot of different organisms that uh, will eat these things. And so we have a seagull who would definitely love to look for some phytoplankton um, or some kelp. We also have this salmon that would eat some smaller fish, which are not drawn, but they will also eat the little animals that live in the kelp, which those little animals that live in the kelp, they eat the kelp. So they would be the primary consumer, which is pretty awesome. Then we have a seagull, which would have a really great day if they caught a salmon. I don't think that happens too often, but then we also have our sea lion up here on the rocks and yeah. they would definitely eat a salmon for sure. That's right. So the food could transfer this way. Maybe even the salmon could get gobbled up by the uh, sea lion there. Um, this is a wonderful example of a different uh, setting, so a different landscape. Um, I'll tell one more example, and then um, you'll get some time to work on your uh, food energy poster. Does that sound like a plan, Zoe? Absolutely. And just so you guys know, this person went above and beyond the requirements. So don't get too uh, stressed out or worried yet because this is just an example. And remember, you only have to do one producer and two consumers. So Absolutely. I'm glad that you shared that reminder with them. This is another example, and this is from a desert ecosystem. And um, so the sun, you can see, is way up here at the top in this ecosystem. And the sun will give its energy to the grass and to the shrubs that are along the river here in this desert ecosystem. And so um, those grasses and shrubs are then eaten by this bighorn sheep right here. 
This artist chose to just draw the head of the sheep and that's perfectly fine. Um, that's a great example of a consumer. And then there's also another food energy transfer happening. Um, the sun also gives its energy to some aquatic um, plant life. And then the water insects eat those up. And then the water insects are gobbled up by the salmon. So even though in this ecosystem, um, not all the animals connect, that's okay. You'll notice it has those things that Zoe tell, uh, told us about, the sun, one producer, at least one producer, and then two consumers. And so now it's at last your turn. I'm going to rewind my slideshow just a tiny bit to show the first example. So when you do your food energy poster, make sure you start with the landscape, use your pencil, use your colors, and your landscape is in your nature journal. So it should be on page number, oh, I'm, I apologize. Um, some of the things that we talked about are in this nature journal. You've got um, some poster resources, and this is on page number six. The food web that you see on your screen, that's on page number five. And then even if you go to page four, um, there's more directions about the food poster there. Um, I apologize, this was, yeah, thank you, Zoe. This was what you'll be um, drawing on for your food energy poster. So now I'll invite you to um, use these resources. You can even have a trusted adult help you at home and um, get a start on your energy poster. So start drawing that landscape, start drawing um, the producer consumers that you can think of. And so I'll invite you to pause the video and try that out. Welcome back. I um, am sure you drew some wonderful food energy uh, posters. What do you think, Zoe? Oh, absolutely. I feel like we gave you guys a lot of good examples to where you could really maybe even pick what your favorite animal was and figure out what they eat and everything. So absolutely. I'm sure they're beautiful. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the next activity that we'll be talking about today is a food calendar. And so on your screen, you see the Kalapuya Foods calendar. I'm going to tell a little bit of um, information about the Kalapuya right now. The Kalapuyans are an indigenous tribe, um, also known as Native, American, <clears throat> Native Americans, and they have traveled all throughout the Willamette Valley, and they eat foods when they are in season or when they normally grow in a particular place. Many of the members of tribes <clears throat> that inhabited this area, like the Kalapuyans, have lived here for thousands and thousands of years since time immemorial. Today, many members of the many tribes in Oregon are now a part of nine confederated tribes, which are often far away from their traditional homelands. They are called indigenous people, and to be indigenous, means that they have lived here in this land for a very, very long time. The Grand Ronde tribe and the Siletz tribe are two of the federally recognized tribes in our state. To be federally recognized means each of these tribes has its own government, just like a country, and they are a separate nation within the United States government. Long ago, Kalapuyans had no grocery stores, no refrigerators, and they didn't need them. They um, used plants and animals around them um, that were plentiful at different times of the year. So I know I like to get my groceries from Trader Joe's and I get all different kinds of foods. Where do you like to get your groceries from, Zoe? Well, my favorite place is Trader Joe's, but I don't live super close to Trader Joe's. So I only go there sometimes, uh, but I usually get my normal groceries from like a Safeway or maybe grocery outlet. Yeah. Think about where your family gets groceries from. And I invite you to tell someone in your family or maybe write it down. Pause the video while you do that. Welcome back. Now that you've shared um, where you get your foods from, the Kalapuya, they um, ate different foods at different times of the year. So I will quickly talk about their food calendar, and then Zoe will share some of the details about it. It's pretty exciting. Um, it starts with fall right here in this circle. 
So during the fall, um, Kalapuyans um, would often catch salmon or um, gather acorns and nuts to eat. And then as the seasons change, they shifted to hunting more deer and elk. You can see a picture right there. And Zoe will tell about all the different parts that um, they used from these animals. One part that I can think of is that they would eat the meat um, from that um, animal in order to survive. As the seasons change, so we go from fall to winter, now is spring, um, Kalapuyans would use greens and then different bulbs or different plants that they might see in the wild. Um, this one is a particular type of plant uh, called a nettle. Am I right, Zoe? Yes. And she'll tell a little bit more about that in just a few seconds. Lastly, um, berries and crayfish would be um, their foods of choice in the summertime. And you notice that um, maybe the elk was only in the winter and in the summertime, only the crayfish. Um, they would adjust their foods based on their needs and maybe even save up some of these um, greens and plants for a time when they wouldn't grow. Like if they wanted to use that nettle plant in the fall, they would have to be sure to collect it in the spring. And so now, uh, Zoe, um, I'll have you tell a little bit more about some of these foods. Absolutely. So like Tony said, they would collect these foods when they are uh, abundant during the season. And then they would do things to preserve their food. Like we said, they did not have refrigerators, but they still had ways to preserve their food so that it would last a really long time. So I'm going to go through a couple examples of how they would use these different things and maybe even preserve some of them. So we're going to start over here with the Nootka rose hips is really awesome it's an interesting word nootka rose hips and we are pretty sure that it was named after a tribe a tribe that most likely um has been joined um condensed into other tribes uh like the confederated tribes of the grand ron um which is really awesome and so how they would use these rose hips is they would actually make a tea out of them just really awesome. So they would grab them, they would dry them out, and then they, because they were dry, they would be able to last for a while, like months and months, because there was no moisture inside for them to get moldy. And then they would add them to water, and all of the nutrients that was dried up inside would get released into that water, and they would drink it, and they would have all of those nutrients from those rose hips, which is pretty awesome. Moving on, we have this beautiful elk here in the middle. So we can tell that from our calendars, um, from the Kalapuya Foods calendar, that elk was mostly eaten in the winter. Why do you guys think maybe in the winter they ate more meat and less berries and plants? Maybe pause for a second and think about, is there a lot of plants growing when it's snowing in the winter? All right, welcome back. The answer is no. There's not a lot of plants growing in the winter, right? So they're going to use what is around. And what's around is animals. Animals survive through the winter too. So they are going to hunt this elk. They are going to use it to eat, like Tony said. They're also going to use other parts of it, which is really awesome. And it's going to help them survive too. So one thing that they would use for sure is their skin, the elk skin, and they would make coats out of it. They would make hats. They might even make a bag out of it to carry all of their other foods, which is really awesome. Another thing that they would use um, elk for is they would actually make string out of the intestines of a elk, which Whoa. this string was actually, I know, this string was actually really strong and they used it in a lot of different things that they would um, use day to day. They had fashion just like us. They had different types of clothing that were good for different things. And they could even use this string for making tools and other things like that, not just for clothes, which is pretty awesome. A way that they would be able to eat the elk, maybe if it's not fresh, they would dry it out. And then the next slide, it's gonna show us what a different type of dried meat looks like. So we'll get back to that in a little bit. Moving on to the last thing on this slide, we have these almost look like garlic, 
um, maybe like a small little onion. Over here we have camas bulbs, which camas is actually a really awesome flower that was really important to the indigenous tribes around here. And they were really pretty. Uh, they're a purple flower when they bloom. But what was really important about them was not the purple flower on top, but it was what grew underneath the ground. So just like onions and sweet potatoes and garlic, those are all root vegetables and they grow underneath the ground. And so they would harvest these camas flowers for their camas bulbs. And their camas bulbs, I heard, kind of taste similar to a sweet potato. And what they would do is they would cook them down in some water so that they would be easier to eat. And they were super, super um, packed of nutrients for them, which is really awesome. Thanks for telling about those ones. I'm going to click ahead on our slide. Okay, here's a few more. Absolutely. So let's start with the nettle since we had already talked a little bit about it. I feel like you guys are a bit curious. And I don't know if you guys know, have, I've touched a nettle plant before and they do have a uncomfortable feeling. It's not the best to touch. But that didn't scare away the Native Americans. They knew that there was still some good stuff in there. So what they would do, they would enjoy these plants two different ways. One way would be in the spring, like our calendar shows. And that's when the plants are just starting to grow again, right? It was right after winter. There's not really any plants. And now we have all of these little baby plants coming. And all of these Native Americans... They haven't had a plant to eat in a while, so they're excited, and they're going to cut this plant down when it's still a little baby, and they don't care because it still has a lot of nutrients. So they're going to take the little baby plant, and they can actually just drop that into some hot water for a couple seconds, and that's going to make it so it's not crunchy, and it's not going to hurt to chew, but it'll still keep all the nutrients, and they could eat it like that. Or another way that they would do this is they would actually dry out the leaves. They would dry them out by hanging them up, very similar to how they did the salmon, which I'll get into in a second. And then they would add it with water later on and drink it like a tea. And just like the rose hips, they, the energy on all the nutrients from inside of those dried up little things, once they're dropped into water, it, all the nutrients is going to come out into the water and you're going to be able to drink all those nutrients and avoid the parts of the plant that really don't feel good in the mouth, which is pretty awesome. So they were really creative with that one. Yeah. Really creative with that one. Um, next, moving along, we have some more meat. Here you guys can see it says dried salmon. So they would dry most meats in the same, well, they would dry all their meats in about the same way. They would cut it into really thin strips and they would hang it up in an area where it got a lot of wind flow. You wouldn't want to hang this up in your closet. Uh, that would not be a good place to hang up some meat. It would be stinky and it would take a long time to dry out because there's not a lot of moving air. So they would probably hang this in an open room that has a lot of windows and have the windows open. Really awesome. And then all of the moisture would uh, evaporate out of it. And so there would be no moisture, which means there could be no mold. And then this dried salmon would last and they would be able to eat this in a couple different seasons because they preserved it, which is awesome. They would also do the elk meat in the same fashion. They would dry it, cut into little strips, dry it out put it in their pack while it's dry and they could eat it dry just like jerky, which is really awesome. And then last but not least is the acorns. So indigenous communities really got creative with acorns too, because when you, if you could just like try to go outside and you eat an acorn, you grab it off the tree or you find it on the ground and you try to eat it, please don't do this. It is going to taste not very good. So acorns have something in them called tannin, right, Tony? Is that how you pronounce it? That is, yes. Yeah. So acorns and some other foods have something called tannin in it, and it kind of just makes them a little bitter, like like really old. I don't know. You guys aren't drinking coffee yet, so I don't want to use that example, but something that doesn't taste exactly right. So not the yummiest thing to do. So what they would do is they would harvest these acorns that have already dropped on the floor and they would put them in a bag and they have different ways to make bags. 
Um, and then they would take that bag and they would put it in a river. And it has to be a river. It can't be a lake and it can't be a pond because think about when you wash your fruit at home. If you just drop it in the sink and let it sit there, it might not get as clean as if you run it underneath the water and let the water get all the germs off. And so they would leave the acorns in a bag in a river for at least four days, maybe even a week. And then when they come back, the river was super powerful and somehow got all the tannins out. The river pulled all the tannins out of the acorn. So now the acorn is ready. It's not gonna taste gross anymore. It's actually gonna taste good, like a, like a walnut possibly, kind of similar to that, maybe similar to a hazelnut. And there would be two ways from there that they could do something with the acorn. One, they could eat it just like that which would be awesome. It doesn't taste like tannin anymore and it would taste yummy. They could eat it just like that or they could make some sort of trail mix and maybe eat some with some dried salmon, you know, like some beef jerky and nut type situation. Or what they could do is they could ground up those dried, so actually before you grind it up, you'd have to dry it out. So you'd put it in a different bag, let it sit out in the sun or in an uh, vent place, a, a place with a lot of air movement, just like the meats, and you would dry it out. Once it was all dried, then you could grind it down with some tools that they had. They had a lot of different things. They looked different than our tools, but they did the same thing. And they would grind it down into a powder. And then that powder would be acorn flour. And with that acorn flour, they could make a lot of different things. But one of their favorite things to make is called a flat cake. Not a pancake, but pretty similar. A flat cake, they would just mix the acorn flour with some water, and then they would cook it over a fire. And it would look pretty much like a pancake, but it would have a lot more nutrients because the acorns have a lot of nutrients in them. But yeah. Wow. After doing all those steps, I'm sure they probably enjoyed some maybe in the season like fall and maybe even they stored some of that flour for a different season if they were feeling like using acorns then absolutely wow. absolutely so now that we've learned a little bit more about these traditional foods um think about the types of foods you like to eat during certain seasons of the year um zoe and i will do a quick uh, conversation in a moment but i'm going to invite you to think about um, when you like to eat certain foods, fall, winter, summer, spring. So please think, think of a, like maybe one or two foods you like to eat during a certain season. Pause the video and press play after you have that food in your mind. Welcome back. Um, one food that I thought of was that in the winter time, um, I like to drink hot chocolate. What about you, Zoe? Ooh, in the winter time, like I told you guys, I'm from Florida. I'm still getting used to the coldness. So in the winter time, I am cold and I am looking to get warmed up. So just like you, yeah, I could definitely go for some hot cocoa. But I also really love to eat soups or like stews or chilies, like maybe mac and cheese, anything that's going to be hot and it's going to warm me up on the inside. I like to eat in the winter. Yeah, me too. Just because in the wintertime, it's cold outside. So that warm food um, tastes good and it warms us up. Now, opposite of winter is summer. And I know in the summertime, um, I like to have ice cream, uh, popsicles, and colder foods. Um, I know watermelon is a great fruit that um, is very cold. What about you, Zoe? What do you like to have in the summertime? I definitely eat a lot more fruit in the summertime than in the winter, for sure. Um, in the summer, I really uh, crave lemonade for some reason. I am always thirsty, usually because I'm hot and um, maybe even a little sweaty at times. <laughs> so I really like to have some fruits. And then I also really love to have like fruit juices or lemonade. Awesome. Um, another season I'm thinking of is fall. And so in the fall, when uh, the leaves start to change color and it's starting to get close to winter, um, some foods that I can think of um, would be, oh gosh, pumpkin pie. Pumpkins are in season in the fall. I like to enjoy that then. Um, what about you, Zoe? Is there a food that you enjoy in the fall? 
Absolutely. So I'm right there with you again with the pumpkin. I love pumpkin, put pumpkin in everything, pumpkin flavored everything. I'm about it. Um, but along with pumpkin, I also I actually really love all the other squash that comes along, like butternut squash and spaghetti squash. And I've actually I love all the squashes, I gotta say. And then one other thing that I think of in the fall is my family celebrates Thanksgiving in the fall. So one of my favorite things to eat during that meal would be um, mashed potatoes and also turkey. So I would draw that in the fall as well. And that is a great um, strategy. If you guys are having a hard time figuring out, you know, what do I eat in different seasons? Maybe think about the different holidays that you celebrate in those different seasons. Um, some examples would be um, like Kwanzaa or um, Christmas or Hanukkah in the winter or Thanksgiving in the fall or maybe 4th of July in the summer and possibly Easter or uh, another spring holiday as well. Those are just the holidays that I practice. So you guys probably celebrate some different holidays than me. Um, so go ahead and think about what your family eats for those uh, family, big family meals. Yeah. Um, and hearing you say about Turkey too, um, one thing I'm thinking of is like, let's say, you know, my family and I, we celebrate Thanksgiving. I enjoy Turkey in the fall. I enjoy Turkey kind of all year round. So I would put that um, all throughout my food calendar and that would be fine. You could put it in one season or you could put it in multiple. Um, although we can go to the store now and kind of buy foods um, during any season we want, there still might be certain foods that we enjoy during a particular holiday, like Zoe said, or during a particular season of our year. Absolutely. In, your, um, in your nature journal on page seven, has the Kalapuya foods calendar that we discussed. And then on page eight, this will be where you get to draw your food calendar. Um, so in the circle, we would love it um, if you drew a picture of your favorite foods um, and then use the colored pencils provided to color them. And then at the bottom, there's lines for each season. So there's a line for fall, winter, spring, and summer. Down there is where you can write the word. So like I said, I would draw turkey in the fall and maybe pumpkins in the fall, and then I could write the words down below. And if you're having trouble spelling the words, um, ask someone at home, ask a family member. They may even give you permission to uh, use the internet to search how to spell that word correctly. Um, and that will be your foods uh, calendar activity. Um, think about maybe one or two foods that you want to know that you for sure are going to start with. And when you have those foods in your head, pause the video and start drawing them in your journal. Welcome back. I'm hoping you got a, a good start with uh, your foods calendar. And we're going to move right along to our final um, activity. This one is called a junk food opinion piece. We earlier in the video saw that yummy cheeseburger. Um, you can see it on your screen there. And so the what is your opinion activity will ask you to have an opinion and do some writing about a certain topic. And so the topic that um, we're going to ask that you think about is, should kids be able to eat junk food? So think about, should kids be able to eat junk food or should they not? Um, pause the video and decide which you're thinking. Welcome back. Now that you're thinking, maybe kids should be able to eat junk food or should not. Um, that will be the start of your opinion piece. And so um, for this activity, junk food um, might be things like potato chips, ice cream, candy, soda, fast food like cheeseburgers and french fries. And even though french fries are really, really tasty, and um, some may argue that, you know, they're made of potatoes, so they're kind of healthy. I think that french fries also contain a lot of salt and sugar and not a lot of nutrients um, like vitamins and minerals. So when you write your junk food opinion piece, you'll need to first decide your opinion. And you'll notice on the screen, we have this bottom one 
And maybe Zoe, can you tell about this third opinion? Um, and then I'll tell more about where they can find the place to write their opinion piece. Absolutely. So as you guys can see, Tony, and as you guys can hear, Tony had already said you can agree, yes, they should be able to, or no, they should not be able to. But I and Tony also think that there's kind of a middle ground too. And so we also added this, and it's kids should sometimes be able to eat junk food. So that is if you're kind of in the middle, if you're like, oh, well, I'm a kid and I don't think we should have junk food, but I really, really love French fries or like me, I really, really love ice cream. And you think, you know what, maybe it's OK if I have it uh, one day a week or maybe it's OK if I eat it after I eat a really uh, high vegetable meal or after I eat all the broccoli off my plate. Maybe you feel like a little bit of junk food is OK. And so you would pick that as your topic sentence. And then in your paragraph, you would have to give examples and support to both sides. So instead of just saying, no, kids shouldn't be able to because it's unhealthy, or yes, kids should be able to because it tastes good, you would have to talk about both, which is kind of a challenge sometimes. But that's what makes it a really good opinion piece. And you might be able to persuade somebody who's reading it to think the same way that you think. That's right. And um, to support your opinion, if you look on page nine in your uh, journal, there are lots of facts that you can use to support your opinion. And then on the following page, page 10, this is where you'll write your opinion. Uh, the directions do say you'll need to have your opinion and then maybe three, four or five more sentences that support your opinion. These sentences, um, you could do as few as three or as many as five, and they should support like, yes, they should be able to eat junk food or no, they should not. I know I think kids should not be able to, and I'll keep my reasons a secret because I'm curious to hear what Zoe's opinion is, and we'll let you think of the reasons on your own. Absolutely. So I kind of gave it away when I was explaining it, but I think <laughs> that right. kids should sometimes be allowed to because when I'm thinking back as an adult, I think, no, kids should be eating really healthy things. But then also I was a kid and I'm like, hey, I really like ice cream. So I got to go with the sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, you can think about uh, how you'll start your opinion piece and maybe um, write one sentence. And so pause the video and get one sentence started and then press play after you've just got the start to your opinion piece. Welcome back. Um, we are finishing up today um, with our reflection, something we enjoy doing at Straub Outdoors. So thinking about that question, what did we learn today? Gosh, we explored some really cool science concepts. We learned about how energy flows from the sun into every living thing. Um, I eat sunshine through lasagna and Zoe eats sunshine through chicken sandwich. Um, and after this video, make sure that you complete those activities we talked about today. There were three of them. Uh, Zoe, can you remind us and review those three activities that they'll be finishing up? Absolutely. So the first activity that we explained was the energy poster. So that is using the sheet of paper and colored pencils and make sure that you have one producer, a landscape and two consumers. And then the next thing that we talked about was the food calendar. So make sure you have at least two foods in each of those seasons that you eat during that season. And then the last thing that we talked about was this food, junk food, specifically junk food opinion piece. Thank you for reviewing those with our group today. Um, something fun that you may want to try at home now that you've done some learning with us today. Maybe you ask somebody in your family or maybe somebody at school or a friend and say something like, did you know we all eat sunshine? because we do. And now you have the science knowledge to prove uh, that. Thank you so much for watching today. And um, we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. And I will stop the recording.